Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie Green, the Public Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. And this is Tammy Hansen. Thank you, Tammy, for providing ASL interpretation this evening. Tonight, we celebrate the second of a two-part series exploring titles highlighted by this year's Literature for Justice reading list in partnership with the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University. If you missed our first event with Dion Bran and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, it'll be available on our YouTube channel for one more week. Deepest thanks are due to this evening's moderator, Literature for Justice Committee member and Center Director, Natalie Diaz, and Center Coordinator, Gianni Ponce, for their caring collaboration. And thanks to you all for joining us. Best known as the presenter of the National Book Awards, the National Book Foundation works year round to reach readers everywhere. This spring, we're celebrating the third and final year of Literature for Justice, which curates an annual reading list focused on the topic of mass incarceration, inspired and supported by the Art for Justice Fund. In addition to public events, this program and each year's guiding committee has supported our efforts to get books around, behind, and inside of prison and detention centers. For this evening's event to Inside Out program participants in Arizona, with thanks again to Gianni and Natalie. Truly this work and partnerships like this one wouldn't be possible without your support. If you're able to, we'll share a link to donate in the chat, or you can visit our website at nationalbook.org slash donate. And now for this evening's program. First, Natalie Diaz will tell us more about the center's work. Then Sarah and Nicole will both read from their books and join Natalie in conversation. We'll drop a bookshop link in the chat to buy these groundbreaking works with thanks to our partner, Loyalty Bookstores in Washington, DC. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Nicole R. Fleetwood is Professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University and author and curator of Marking Time, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism. Her exhibitions received praise by the New York Times, Nation, Village Voice, and New Yorker. She's also the author of On Racial Icons and Troubling Vision, which won the Laura Romero Prize from the American Studies Association. Sarah Haley is Associate Professor of Gender Studies and African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she directs UCLA Center for the Study of Women. Social Sciences Division, Black Feminism Initiative. Her research focuses on abolition and histories and theories of Black feminism, gender, and the carceral state. And our moderator, Natalie Diaz, is Mojave and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian Tribe. She is the author of two poetry collections, When My Brother Was an Aztec and Postcolonial Love Poem a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award for Poetry. Diaz is director of the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands and is the Maxine and Jonathan Marshall Chair in Modern and Contemporary Poetry at Arizona State University. She lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you. Natalie Diaz. I'm director for the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University. Bienvenidos a todo and gracias por venir. Gracias to Nicole Fleetwood and Sarah Haley for joining us tonight. Gracias to Natalie Green and the National Book Foundation and the Literature for Justice team for elevating literature that engages social justice in the carceral system. I have the great luck of welcoming you all to my homeland tonight. ASU sits on the lands and waters of my Akamal Atam people and our Pipash cousins. All around us are the remainders of our Hohokam or Huhugam ancestors canal systems, which flourished this desert and whose innovations rival any architectural wonder that exists today. The Center for Imagination in the Borderlands is an indigenous space at ASU 
where we constellate stories, knowledges, and language across our many bordered lands and bodies through strategic and exploratory modes of research, conversation, and performance. Essential to our understanding of indigeneity is that indigeneity is a relationship with the land, a connection that moves through and yet beyond where we are or how we got here and represents an evolving attention to and practice of relationality with land, water, and life. Arizona is a crucible for the many questions we find ourselves asking regionally, nationally, and throughout the world. We are entangled in settler colonialism's warring concepts of abundance and scarcity, of water, land, language, borders, migration, race, extraction, art, surveillance technology, incarceration, abolition, the body, the list goes on and on. ASU is a unique space with critical capacities to broaden these conversations because Arizona is a space of tension, a tension that necessitates thoughtful action and innovation. CIB was born from the realization that tension is not a condition of who we are, but an energy we can reorganize to create conditions for the freedoms we each dream. The imagination shaped in this desert and in these border lands are capable of influencing and catalyzing the futures we believe we deserve. Tonight, we are welcoming Nicole back to us. She has visited our homelands before and spent time with our brothers and sisters and siblings in Perryville, one of our Arizona state prison complexes. My first experience with Perryville and art on the inside was in college. I went to university on a Division I scholarship to play basketball, and my cousin Robbie went to prison for attempted murder. He was my best friend. We had joint family birthday parties, sharing the same cake until we were 12 years old and quit having birthdays. His letters arrived to my coach's office on campus. He often included pictures his cellmate drew sometimes of a girl dunking a basketball with an eagle fe feather tied to her ponytail and trembling in the air. He never recovered from prison, even after he was released, and he died two years ago from a burst stomach ulcer. Perryville is also where my sister was recently incarcerated. I am grateful for the work that Sarah has done to constellate the many different aspects of the carceral system in touching and affecting the lives of black women which in turn makes a pathway for me to consider how my sister has been touched by it. In our occupied lands and languages, we must have the courage to ask impossible questions. What is the language we need to live right now? Whose freedom must I also imagine in imagining what freedom means to me? What will it require of pain or joy for us to become not necessarily human, but the kind of life a human might yet tend and care for. Our future is now, as it has always been. It is not a structure of time, rather it is a way of touch and holding, a reciprocity, how we arrive to one another and how we receive one another. It is our luck to welcome Sarah Haley and Nicole Fleetwood. Gracias. Thank you so Natalie, much. thank you for those beautiful words. I just needed to say that. I'm not sure if that, <laughs> just those, what you said, that invocation was so beautiful. Thank you. Oh, it's our luck to have you both here. So it really was so beautiful. Natalie, I'm still sitting with it. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be thinking about that for some time. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start um, with a reading and um, both of our authors will read and then we'll move into a a uh, short conversation, so. The days are dreary, the nights are weary and long. I lay awake for hours, longing for my happy home. I have often heard of mercy and have never known what mercy mean. But if it mean my freedom, Lord, please have mercy on me. My father's dead and my mother is blind and I'm behind these bars trying to build this time. In her poem, Friendless Prisoner, M.B. Barnes offers a construction project for time in a historical context defined in part by the establishment of the Works Progress Administration, which primarily, although not exclusively, employed men 
in public infrastructure projects in the 1930s. Her commentary is on the necessity of building the scaffolds of time, building this time. What should these times look like? What does it mean to build this time in this time? Written from Parchman Penitentiary Farm in Mississippi in the mid 1930s, Friendless Prisoner is part of a black feminist abolitionist poetic scene that emerged at Parchman featuring writers including Bertha Riley, Lily Neal, Cora Jones, all of whom have names that need saying and work that merits listening. They exploded the prison farm, they explored the prison farm as a condition that structured affective material and social realities. In other words, their poems confronted carcerality as condition rather than seeing individual conditions as the problem of punishment that needed to be solved or reformed. These poems were sometimes set to song with lyrics like, when I go home, I'm gonna wear my dresses above my knees. When I go home, I'm gonna wear my dresses above my knees. I'm gonna sell my stuff to who I please. You talking about trouble? You don't know what trouble mean. You talking about trouble? You don't know what trouble mean. What I call trouble is a singer sewing machine. I begin my brief time today with a poem about time as a way of marking my gratitude for a history of black feminist abolitionist poetics that has largely escaped view by writers and academics, but has never before been more urgent. Black feminist abolitionist poetics help us rethink the relationship between home and carcerality, capture and freedom, time and place, desire and relation, and about the beauty of Black queer life. I also begin this way in order to express my gratitude to Nicole Fleetwood for her extraordinary book about the aesthetic work on time produced inside U.S. cages, and Natalie Diaz's poetic field of vision that in some ways, in the ways of reparation love and ghosts and desire and rage and what she calls mercy lux, seem to me to converge with Barnes and Jones and Neil and Riley and the other poets at Parchman. I'm excited to be here and appreciate the National Book Foundation Literature for Justice Program and Natalie Green and Tammy Hansen for making this conversation possible. In early 20th century Southern prison camps, every day was a practice of making time amidst constant terror imposed by the overwhelmingly black populations of convict laborers and a dread that was gendered for everyone. There were places like the Dade County coal mines where prisoners in Georgia were daily forced to mine and burn coal to build infrastructures of Southern industrial development. Researching these places is challenging because the historical record almost exclusively documents conditions, policies and crimes and conditions, which is not the sum of life. With scant art and few remaining firsthand accounts, little is known about the making of time in Southern convict leasing camps, particularly for Black women, about their sentiments and desires and relationships. So for the rest of my time, I will read an excerpt from my book, No Mercy Here, that uses informed speculation grounded in hundreds of archival documents to create a portrait of the violence endured the care that might have been, and the power that haunts the archive as a structure of violent erasure. More than 100 miles from home, Adeline Henderson saw hundreds of people in her predicament when she finally arrived at Dade County coal mines. The journey seemed so long and the place so strange, she wondered if she was dreaming. All men, all striped, faces dirty from the coke ovens and the mines. Where would she sleep? It wasn't until deep dark that she met Nancy Morris, who would stay in the bed next to her. For her part, Nancy was relieved that finally, after three months, another woman had come to the camp and they would share sleeping quarters. In arguably the worst convict lease camp in the state, it was the worst time to arrive at Dade. 1884 was a cold year and the harvest did not yield, so there were no vegetables to be had. Despite the cold the cold, the air was still stifling in the two scarcely ventilated barracks where they stayed. 
Meat was also scarce, so they ate only cornbread and syrup for months and months and months. Nancy told Adeline that they would have to get up before the sun earlier than everyone else to get the camp ready for dawn work. Then they would go to the Coke ovens. Over the next few days, Nancy showed her how to get the water and boil the lye and mend the clothes and make the cornbread and how to help the men in the red hot fire of the Coke ovens. Adeline mentioned that everyone at home called her Addie. Three months later, Addie told Nancy about Moses. Adeline said she wouldn't be here forever because Moses was going to get out soon and he had lots of friends and they would help her. And then she would help Nancy. When, Nancy wondered. Yesterday was not soon enough because everyone was sick. They touched their mouths to check for bleeding, knowing that it was the first sign that the weakness and the, um, the weakness would come and then death. Although they, did, although they did not catch pneumonia or typhoid or consumption, they were consumed with dread and gloom. Four men went to the bathroom and vomited. One never came back. After the guard screamed, saying Na Nancy and Adeline were to blame for the vomiting and the death, because they were wretched cooks who tried to kill the others. But it was the bread and the syrup and the bugs and the dirt in all of it. They worried at every bite and mourned the others. For a few minutes each night, Addie told Nancy Moses stories. Both Adeline and Moses came from Cobb County. And when Moses got her out, they would be married and lived with the four little ones Addie loved so much and had left behind. And they would take care of her ailing mother. One night when she was especially tired, Nancy blurted it out. Since Adeline loved her baby so, why did she stop the last one from taking a first breath? After that, Adeline refused to speak to Nancy, not even to tell her that the evidence against her was mostly circumstantial. So Nancy wondered if the baby stopped breathing on its own or if Nancy couldn't keep the baby with all of the others crying and needing. But she realized it was not a story to pass on and never asked again. For, for weeks, she feared that Addie would never speak to her outside of the cooking and the mending and the Coke ovens anyway. But Adeline came around in the weeks before the food stopped altogether and the guards tried to starve them all. Instead of Moses' stories, they talked about the plan. No more cooking or mending or cleaning or mining or burning Coke. No more work at all. The whisper of no more work had been making its way through the camp for weeks. And Addie and Nancy helped stoke scraps from each meal until they had enough to last several days. Enos and AJ told the guards that no one would work until they had meat and vegetables and until they stopped the whippings. Soon they were surrounded by all of the guards, guns drawn. And things stayed that way all day and all night until the next day it seemed that shooting would begin. They forced the blacksmiths out of the stockade first. They made them chisel away, unshackling and reshackling the others until everyone was chained together, knowing that work would resume at sunup. The night was quiet except for the screams of Enos, AJ, and the others who had dared to make the demands and the sound of the extra thick lash meeting skin. They cringed when they saw the first man being whipped with the new strap that Overseer Kilpatrick had invented with shoe pegs that tore so deep the wounds never really closed. Despite wounds that would not close over nine winters and summers, the Coke ovens, at the Coke ovens, Nancy and Adeline built a friendship born of years that felt like lifetimes. There were bad nights when Moses left and Adeline got word that even though 29 white men from Powder Springs had signed that letter to the governor, she wasn't getting out. After Adeline learned that her petition for clemency had been denied, she wondered when Moses would forget her and if her children already had. Few personal letters got to that corner of hell at the top of Georgia that they called Dade. A year later, Nancy and Adeline learned that they would be moving, not getting out, just moving, but they would be going together. They held hands and wondered if the next place would be worse. Nancy wondered if there would be Coke ovens. This would be the longest journey yet, past Nancy's sister in Newton and Adeline's children in Cobb County, past Atlanta, Stone Mountain, and Athens. It took more than a day until they made it to the smaller camp. When they arrived, they looked at each other, stunned to find that all the other prisoners were women. For nine years, they had thought that they, would be the only, they might be 
two of the only women in stripes in all of Georgia. If they made it out of Dade, they could definitely make it out of this Hardmont place. Adeline took Nancy's hand again when she saw the look of terror on her face as Colonel Maddox pat patted Nancy's shoulder. And she covered a shivering Nancy with her own blanket and held her head as she retched on the long night after the guard took his turn with her. And they hugged when Nancy told her three weeks later that she had to put the rags on, both relieved that no baby would be coming, at least not this time. Thank you. So good evening. Um, I want to begin by saying what a delight it is to be in conversation with Sarah Haley, someone I just deeply admire and I have learned so much from and consider an invaluable friend um, and colleague. Thank you, Natalie and Natalie and Tammy and Dwayne and everyone else who made this possible. Incarceration has restructured my family in my hometown of Hamilton, Ohio, in Southwest Ohio. Countless relatives have been arrested and detained. Some have been convicted and sentenced, while others have been held indefinitely and then let go. Studies of the rise in prisons and the growth of the carceral state offer insightful explanations of what many of us experience in our own communities. The mass removal of family members, neighbors, and friends, along with the permanent stigma on imprisoned people and their families. As I came of age in the late 1980s, people around me, mainly young Black teens, but also women and men, were being shipped off to prison at such a frequency that their sudden disappearance and long-term absence became the norm. Boys my age who went to school with me were there and then gone some never to return. They became invisible to us and hard to reach because of all the mechanisms the carceral state uses to separate imprisoned people from their families and communities. We had no words to describe the utter devastation, the despair. Opening our local newspaper was often cause for pain and embarrassment as photographs of people we knew seen in handcuffs were all too common. Often these were images of black children and teenagers infamously referred to as super predators in the 1990s by journalists and politicians alike. At the same time, there were other images being produced about mass incarceration, images that rarely made the news and had little or no public circulation. They offered different interpretations of prisons and their impact. These were not journalistic, scholarly, or legal documents. They were a diverse assortment of artworks and illustrations that came from inside the prisons themselves. Studio photos, handmade greeting cards, drawings, paintings, and other artworks by incarcerated people. Relatives in prison sent home graphite drawings and birthday cards designed by incarcerated artists. Some facilities permitted us to take photographs together in front of colorful backdrops when we visited our jailed loved ones. The visiting rooms where we sat across from each other often displayed paintings, miniatures, and sculptures made by artists warehoused there. These objects were not new forms of prison art, but as the size of the prison population boomed, the visual culture of mass incarceration grew along with it. Marking time grows out of a decade of research and programming. I set out to engage the politics of art making in prisons and more expansively art as politics in an era of extensive human caging and other forms of carceral power. How has the colossal reach of the prison industrial complex shaped contemporary art institutions and art making? And how does, the, how does visual art help to reveal the depth of devastation caused by our nation's punishment system? In Ronnie Goodman's 2008 painting, San Quentin Arts and Corrections Art Studio, the artist is alone at work in a studio. The self-portrait shows him inside a cavernous space of multi-storied walls and beamed ceilings. We see him in profile from the knees up, dressed all in blue and bent slightly forward, studying a print. On the walls, dwarfing him and above his reach are portraits, landscape paintings, and still life renditions. The details of the workspace, the light, the height, and the open floor pan all suggest an idyllic scene for the creation of art. 
Goodman made the painting while he was incarcerated at San Quentin and taking art classes through the William James Association, a nonprofit organization that provides classes in California prisons. The prison studio in Goodman's painting is a space of imaginative possibility, as well as a place constrained by his incarceration and the layered history of the carceral state. His painting is a reflection on the condition under which art is made within prisons while also reimagining the space. It is an example of what I call carceral aesthetics, ways of envisioning and crafting art that reflects the conditions of imprisonment. Every year, incarcerated people create millions of paintings, drawings, sculptures, greeting cards, collages, and other visual material that circulate inside prisons between incarcerated people and their loved ones in private collections and more recently in the public domain. The project highlights the compulsion to make, to create, and to produce meaning under brutal and austere circumstances in the larger setting of the carceral state. There are lessons here developed by people in prison about how to create to forge relations and to embody and represent one's life under unimaginable conditions. And so we learn about a society that relies on punitive confinement as a solution to myriad social, economic, political, ecological, and health crises. Marking time has been made possible by the transformative vision of freedom, justice, and belonging of an amazing group of currently and formerly incarcerated artists and their loved ones and allies. They inspire me every day. Our freedom is interdependent. Prisons, indefinite detention, parole, co concentration camps exist in as much as we allow them to. Thank you. Gracias, Nicole, and gracias, Sarah, um, for, for reading. Um, again, it's really lucky to have you with us um, because we are very, um, as an Indigenous space, we're very uh, invested in, in place and what that means to each of us. And as we know, the carceral system is um, very efficient at dislocating us from, you know, as both of you have touched on, what is home or what can be home and, and trying very hard to uh, create conditions that don't feel like home. Um, and then even, you know, being, uh, having left uh, prison or the carceral system, there are so many things in place that um, disallow us from connecting back to, to place and the things that make us home. And so um, I'm thinking of a term that uh, Ruthie Gilmore in our uh, earlier talk had talked had mentioned as being a word that was important to her. Um, and she was pulling this from Catherick McKittrick in conversation with Sylvia Winter and thinking about livingness, black livingness. And so um, since we are in this pandemic condition, which we know has heightened um, some of the, the urgencies and tensions and emergencies in um, our prison systems and thinking toward livingness and place and the, the connectedness of those things. I'm wondering if you, you can both, and we'll start with Sarah and then Nicole, but if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, where you're joining us from and, and um, you know, some of the ways that you have returned in this pandemic time to, uh, to place or to what means home to you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so I'm zooming in um, from Tongva lands in Los Angeles. California in, um, in my house. And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to um, be such sort of sequestered at home or confined for some of us, others of us forced, right? Coerced through, you know, um, late capitalism to go out and work and how, um, that relationship between home and work um, should be teaching us a lot in this moment about the precarity of life, about sort of care as this commodity, care as coerced, but also care as the material for life. Um, and, you know, I've heard, speaking of Ruthie Gilmore, I've heard her talk about abolition as life in rehearsal. Right. So to think about abolition, not as the, the, the removal of a specific institution necessarily, though that may be 
um, necessary, but really about making, right? Making a, a daily practice of making life. Um, and it's all hazy for me still. It's weird to be a historian living in such momentous historical times where you're trying to make sense of things in real time. But what thinking about the carceral state being at home has taught me is really even more about how carcerality is a regime rather than a collection of institutions. Dylan Rodriguez has argued that and how domestic space, the home is critical to that regime. That's what I, my research has been before the pandemic. I was starting to write a book about that very thing. And then we were all sort of um, sequestered at home, but thinking about the carceral state's necessary intrusion into the home, right? On a scale that I think is so underappreciated. You know, it's in moments where we think about Breonna Taylor that we recognize it, um, but there are so many more folks who have been traumatized, even if not killed in the precise same way as Breonna Taylor. And that is not simply a set of isolated um, conflagrations of spectacular violence, but as necessary, that kind of intrusion is necessary material for something like the war on drugs, literally could not have proceeded without daily enactments of violence against mostly brown and black families um, uh, in the home. And so I've really been thinking a lot about um, what it means to work from a particular place under particular conditions, but also um, really, I guess the magnitude of the carceral regime that I think we should be thinking about differently. And it's last thing I'll say, it's, it's like really remarkable to me that, you know, something like this pandemic has not shaken dramatically, for example, narratives about like home confinement as a softer, gentler form of incarceration. People can barely stay home for five minutes and yet sort of expect this to be this enlightened mode of punishment. So. And Sarah, thank you for what you said about home because it's it's a vexed concept and term, especially for people in prison and people once they're released from prison. And you know, for me, in so many ways, this project is honoring Ronnie Goodman, who um, you know made the painting that I discussed in my reading while he was in San Quentin. Um, and he was partly connecting San Quentin, this penal colony. Um, to a site just a few miles away, also in the Bay, um, Alcatraz Island. Um, and I'm also thinking about Ronnie uh, once he was released from prison and lived on the streets of San Francisco for over a decade, like many formerly incarcerated people, like many indigenous Black and Latinx people, especially throughout uh, the West Coast. Um, and he died on the streets of the Mission District. Um, in August of 2020, unhoused. Yeah, uh, gracias for, for sharing that, both of you. Um, and so I'll move into just kind of the first uh, kind of question for us to, uh, uh, to move forward together and, and feel free, of course, to, to move within this question. Um, I'm thinking within the conditions of, of any uh, oppressive regime, and, and Sarah, you you know, you talked about Rodriguez's like framing of the regime and the importance of that and thinking about the conditions in any occupied land. Um, we often frame or contextualize art and or queerness, um, uh, even intimacy as refusals and um, whether those are refusals of judicial policy of carcerality um, or or other lenses that deny our dignities. And this framing, when used as an umbrella, it can disallow us the abundance of our lives, um, that by nature, by our very creation, we are imaginative and capable of pleasure and joy. Or, um, Sarah, you also uh, mentioned frivolity when I'm thinking about um, thinking of some of the blues songs. Um, and, it, and, and sometimes that framing, it's, it's as if our imaginations and our, our makings, we've talked about the importance of making, having that capacity. Sometimes that, that framing as refusal is that our imaginings and our makings are forged only 
out of or against austerity and suffering. Um, and I want to, if I can, I want to uh, just read something from um, each of your books. And there's a point where Nicole is citing Sarah. Um, and I want to read uh, something that Ndume um, Ola Tashuni said um, in Nicole's book. And I'm, because I'm thinking about that imagination that is a, a natural condition. It's not something only, uh, you know, created by a pressure. Um, and they write, and, and in the EPUB that, well, that every one of you who's watching this has received, uh, there's this image, so you'll be able to see um, this really beautiful uh, winds of change. And they say, um, Ola Tushani says, I just always wanted to use vibrant colors because color for me was always a form of resistance. You probably know that in most jails and prisons, if you can see the paint on a wall, they're all white, gray, or some dull color. You're in an environment devoid of color. The one thing I knew and understood while I was sitting on death row, the one thing the people couldn't control was my mind and my thoughts. Even though at some point, if they wanted to come in and take me and execute me, they certainly could have did that. But the thing they couldn't do was take my mind. I refused to give that up. Even though you've got me in this colorless environment, you can't stop the color that was actually happening in my head. And then in the previous page in the book, um, uh, Nicole, you cite, uh, you cite Sarah. And so, uh, Sarah, I'm just going to read your last name, even though you're sitting here with us, because I'm just <laughs> going to read that, that portion of the book. Um, Haley discusses how black girls and women were punished for violating white aesthetic projects. Focusing on the case of young black girls convicted of destroying flower pots and taking flowers from the property of white homeowners. And it goes on, they were punished harshly and sentenced to convict labor for, quote, destroying the aesthetic pleasures of white property rights and in so doing, creating a history of no decor. So I'm thinking again about that framing. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to some of your experiences in regard to how the black imagination and, and black livingness um, of black queerness, even and art also disrupt and refuse to submit to racial capitalism and settler colonialism, uh, not only against, but because they are natural conditions of our existence and the, and the compatiousness of, of black living. And maybe Sarah will come back to you and then go on. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, Nicole's work teaches us so much about this. So I feel like I really want to hear what she has to say about Black aesthetics as, um, you know, I remember reading her book and thinking how much it teaches us about what is produced in relation to violation and in excess of, of violation, right? Um, and so, but for me in that moment in No Mercy Here, what I'm talking about, black girls who run through, um, you know, segregated, this is in the early 20th century, segregated Georgia smashing flower pots. I was so impressed, right, by their boldness courage right their aesthetic courage and also so depressed by perhaps an unfair expectation of history of what i could not know so like we know that they smashed um this site of beauty because we presume that beauty right represented property whites and rights and whiteness um and so they they you know lived in conditions that were oppressive that were scarce marked by scarcity but always forced to look at right the opulence of white supremacy and in particular white supremacist domesticities so um there was an aesthetic commentary right there was a commentary on where beauty resided and who had access to it and that is a form of refusal but um what i had i had to try to imagine was what was going on in excess of precisely as you're saying, Natalie, it's such a generative question, right? What is an excess of that act as a mode of refusal, which it obviously is in the archive. And that's where the archive stops, which is the violence of it, which is like, 
What were they whispering to each other? What were they laughing? Were they dancing on the flowers, right? Were they, um, they end up being in prison and then they try and dig their way out of the stockade. Like these are girls whose imagination is creating abolitionist practice and commentary, commenting on um, aesthetic violence, really. And I wanted to know more about the ways in which their lives were abolitionists and the, the ways in which they understood beauty together and, and their dress and what they talked about when they weren't smashing flower pots. And I think in some ways that's presumptuous of me as a researcher, as someone living in the future, a kind of demand to know. Um, people like Catherine McKittrick talk about illegibility, Terry Ann Williamson, illegibility, right? And like the beauty of opacity. Um, but still, I will admit, I kind of wanted to know because I wanted to um, think with them about how they were building life in excess of refusal. And that's in some ways a limit um, in doing this kind of Black feminist historical work and, and something that Nicole's work and your work, Natalie, really just explodes for me. You know, Natalie, thank you for going to that moment in Sarah's book via reading my reading this passage where I'm citing her because I was so. It, it's such a vivid and visual moment, the way Sarah describes that. And, and to me, it, 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 it really is a, a kind of uh, Sarah, I know, um, engages with the work of Sadia Hartman and Tina Campton, like practices of refusal. And it is to me this really an affront to settler colonialism when the when the girls are doing that because it is about a kind of uncaging right i mean part of the part of the logic of settler colonialism uh, co um, colonialism is not just the caging of of people but it's also the caging <laughs> you know the caging of flowers the property relations right and so there's a way that that is a type of uncaging um and and so that for me, it's a very beautiful moment where the flowers are kind of released from <laughs> this kind of potted confinement, right? A type of cultivation that is also about um, um, uh, reproduction of whiteness, you know, the type, this, the kind of cultivation of a certain idea of what 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 the natural world should look like and how it should be presented to certain eyes, right? as um, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and so I'm gonna say your question, like what, oh, I think something that really um, struck me through talking to artists who've been in prison or have a relationship to imprisonment and, and kind of art across the carceral divide is one, how like the black radical tradition runs throughout so many different practices by a range of artists um, that, uh, artists who are engaged in various forms of art making um, really receive this kind of radical uh, education around race and ethnicity in the U.S. through um, carcerality. And so many of the white artists who do appear in the book learn really about whiteness and really critical and um, uh and in critical ways that allowed them to create anti-racist practice, anti practices because they saw how whiteness got al uh, aligned with state violence and power in prison. Um, and um, one of the artists I think who uh, walked me through this kind of the way that um, aesthetic practices and sociality take place in prison it is um, Gilberto Rivera, who's born um, a few miles away from where I sit in Puerto Rico. He was born in a small town here in Puerto Rico and then moved to Brooklyn, where he became a graffiti artist working um, along with Black and Latinx kids in Brooklyn. And then he was sentenced to prison and um, learned oil painting when he was in the same in a pr uh, prison with Leonard Peltier and some other A members who were painters and then was sentenced and he was constantly being moved because he was labeled quote a gang member and he was um, and because he was had that label they did something called diesel therapy which was constantly about unhousing and unsettling him moving him in the middle of night from federal prison to federal prison he never knew where he was going to land 
But he used that journey as like this kind of aesthetic inquiry. So everywhere he went, he learned new artistic skills. He was sentenced to like Louisiana, a real prison in Louisiana, where he learned how to sew by a, a black woman there who was working um, in the sewing room and taught him how to sew. And then he incorporate, incorporated that into his art. And then he ended up in New Jersey, where he worked with Jesse Crimes, a white artist, and Jared Owens, a black artist. And they created this like radical um, political uh, theory, art making critique circle inside of a federal prison. Um, and so for me, it really was thinking about these practices in captivity these kind of freedom practices in relationship to this much longer history, you know, thinking about another literature for justice recipient, um, Kelly Leiter Hernandez and the, the work that she does to think about this very long history of captivity. Um, and, and it just dawned on me as working on this book that the history of captivity is the history of people making art about captivity. And so um, I was just like in the book thinking about like how that plays out in this kind of contemporary uh, system of carcerality that uh, we call mass incarceration. And, you know, as and it's, we, and though it's a misnomer, but it's the way that we're talking about this kind of current moment, this current configuration of the relationship between state violence, captivity and what Ruthie talks about is premature death. Yeah. Um Gracias. There's so many. I'm t actually taking so many notes while we're sitting here writing off to the side. Um, I mean, it's making me think a lot, too, about um, and, and again, this, you know, and this will probably be the case, but this circles back through some of, of the things we've talked about. But um, the, the distinctions or blurrings between uh, what is intimate and what is private or what is public or what is public private um, and and how those things, um, uh, you know, like you say, like to, to create a space of critique and, and the, the politic of that, the power of doing that within uh, a prison. Um, and, and there's a, um, a moment in your book, Nicole, and I'm going to bounce to uh, a line from Sarah's book as well. And um, it, talking about photographs, because again, I think this, you know, the idea of the archive um, also that uh, Sarah was, was hitting on. And um, you write, within the context of carceral institutions, the regulation of intimacy is magnified. In fact, one of the conditions of being in prison is the ways in which forms of intimacy and privacy are unavailable. And you, you are talking about the photos and what they're able to capture. And you continue, smiling, hugging, and performing a sense of togetherness are deliberate and labored activities when carceralities and strictures of doing time mark these photographic moments as both fleeting and enduring. Um, and, and I'm thinking about, um, about that, uh, that word deliberate and labored, um, because I think there's something about labor again, that we bifurcate. And so we, we bifurcate, uh, labor from sensuality and labor from love and care, even though we know in our intimate settings, the, the true and, and weighted labor of love and care. Um, and so I'm thinking about, uh, I'm also thinking about, uh, Sarah, your, your book. And, um, so I'm wondering as we're thinking about these ideas of, of private and public, I'm also wondering if, if you can talk a little bit, Sarah, about the blues and poetry. Um, as it relates back to some of the ways Nicole handles art and, and makes art this generous space with regard to gender and queerness. And I'm thinking of, um, I, I mentioned this line earlier, um, I'm thinking uh, when you're talking about Ma Rainey, uh, Blues the World Forgot, Rainey plays with erasure, contradiction, tragedy, and frivolity in a song that declares, I feel like going to jail. And I'm thinking about uh, blues and also art uh, as languages uh, and, and practices, practices of the imagination, but also how they, they make language for us or they offer us language that doesn't exist in other settings. Um, and that they are also a sensuality and a way of touch that happens intimately um, 
and that that intimacy then can be carried out in public. You know, Nicole, you're talking about the togetherness of art making. I know going into to Perryville, when we have a group of women at the table and we're talking about poetry, looking beneath the table and seeing their legs linked together. You know, so so all of these ways that um, that we're coming together through art, through the blues, through poetry, and and what that offers us of of sensuality and those blurrings between um, you know what we have to fight for of of intimacy in public, um, and and you know just kind of that within the carceral system. So I know that's a very uh, a rambling question, but if you can, if there's anything in there you you can attach to. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to say I learned a lot from Sarah's book because I, um, you know, I was looking at this visiting room space where like intimacy is so regulated and commodified so that you have to pay for these pictures. And the more prints you buy, the more time you have to like hug and kiss on your relative. Um, and but I think that the type of um, intimacy that Sarah um, documents um, is so important in the way that it exceeds the mandate of the state around gender and sexual regulation um, and a type of uh, you know kinship that's that's a, that about kind of about a non-lineal uh, type of belonging and a type of um, and I don't even think solidarity is a word a type of kind of loyalty and and for me that loyalty is a type of intimacy that we like the people and i I've, I've met and i interviewed from the book they, the the way that they have such loyalty and affinity for each other it's like a bond that like most of them are out of prison now and the way that they talk about each other with such like favor with such you know like to uh I remember talking to Fred Moten about the idea of to favor, like that's a, that's like a black uh, familiar term to say you favor someone, which means you might look like someone, but it's a type of proximity and bond that is like, um, that means your body is, in, is kind of in reverberation with that person that you're reverberating with them. There's a, there's a vibrational element to it. And so, if you see like the artists now in the space together, there's still this kind of vibrational element that they created among each other as part of a kind of practice of, of surviving prison that they continue. And it's, it's, and I see it as a type of loyalty. I don't know. I don't know if I can find another word for it, but it's in, intimacy that, and by loyalty, I don't mean, um, I don't mean something that locks other people out. But I, I think it is about a kind of living for and living alongside someone else. They live for each other in some way. So in that way, it's not just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of way of creating community and creating family and to create, and, and it's, it's very powerful. I'm rambling, I'm sorry, but it, it, for me, it's like really, it, it's a, it's a type of way of uh, the way that I want to be in community in relation to others. I saw that happening among people who had been captive and are no longer, and some of them are still captive, but it's a type of relationality that I, I, I strive to live in my day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, you know, I hope you talk more about that and write more about that, Nicole, because I really just am so struck by the power of how you're framing loyalty as um, a mode of intimacy, as a mode of um, relation. And it's just like really so true, right? That loyalty is like both the vernacular and a kind of modality of the dispossessed. And it gets back to Natalie's question before about refusal and what's in excess of refusal, um, both like loyalty as produced by conditions and and so much more. And so, like, I could just sit and listen to you talk about that.
for the rest of you know the time. But um, thank you for that. And so this that's question, what your reading said to me, Sarah. The reading of Addie and that's what I heard in that reading. Yeah, that loyalty, right? Like, yeah, exactly. That's what I heard. Absolutely. Um, and you know, it's like it that sort of concept raises a whole nest of questions that I think Natalie's um sorry yeah Natalie's original question gets at which is the relationship between intimacy and privacy so how do we think about that when we know that for black and latinx and indigenous folks privacy is a pretense privacy is always subject to explosion there is no such thing um really truly right as subaltern privacy and yet privacy is still so important and it's about fragmented privacy it's about the stealing of time it's about you know um again this question of what you produce and maintain the kinds of beauty you produce and create amidst peril and i think you know folks like kevin kwashi and shunikro roach are doing this amazing work in those um on those questions of life produced in quiet and in in private um despite its tenuousness but you know i think about so, so adeline and nancy or ma rainey um or any of the other folks that we're thinking of, with and about today and you wonder like still despite the beauty why you have to be in jail Right. Like it's just like. Um, how do we. Think with practices of such world creating beauty amidst the world destroying violence that is unrelated, unrelenting. And what does it mean for Ma Rainey to offer us a vision of black queer life, a vision of like loyalty and joy? And to always have to be, and in some ways, the only condition of possibility for that precise mode of beauty is the bars, right? Is the kind of constant policing, is the, vi the like extreme violence of that. It's like a question that plagues all of us, I know, um, and that is unresolvable and that is impossible. But um, I think it makes sense to continue working through it. And so I'm thinking about Again, this Ma, Ray, Ma Rainey line, you know, I, I feel like going to jail um, and thinking about that, uh, Nicole is part of the black vernacular and thinking about those moments of, of intimacy. And I know something that has been uh, really important. So, you know, as a poet, just generally, but also as an indigenous person, as, you know, a Latinx person, a queer person, as someone whose, um, you know, partner is black, one of the things during this kind of pandemic um, time for us, like we've been very intentional about the language in our home. And like that has been, I think the most important language to us. So less what we put out to the public and more in these intimate moments. And so I'm wondering, um, and you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the, the lexicons that, that have been used by black revolutionaries and black abolitionists and within your work. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, as we think back through these vernaculars, as we think back through the, the language that has been meaningful to us and feels powerful, whether that's opacity or illegibility or livingness, what is some of the language that has felt the most important to you right now um, in, in your intimate hours? You know, Nicole, we're talking about family um, in, in your work, you know, in, in the literal space, physical space of your home. Uh, as you're turning back to to your work and to your pages, um, and and as you're thinking toward and through um, and beyond the carceral system and some of these structures that you you all are working with, what are what are the phrases or languages that you find yourself returning to or um, arriving to uh, anew? Yeah, I you know I mean something I actually say to myself um, a lot is um i love angela davis's line that freedom is a constant struggle but sometimes i say freedom is a constant journey i'll say that to myself 
Um, and I think what, you know, in the last year, in terms of just how we all have shifted what life looks like on scale for me, because it's like the scale of my life has shifted so that often I'm operating in an interior space, but I've also done like, I don't know, hundreds of Zoom from classes to events over the past year, right? So there's a there's a different kind of scale. And um, I've just been kind of paying attention to how often um, we use language of punishment. Like, uh, like there, it's just the like, it's punitive. It's like regulation, you know, even in like, you know, you have to do this by X time in an email or, you know, just that kind of that constant regulation through punishment. Um, and just even thinking about how many of the artists, once they're released, they're still part of the stigma is that they're still they're so many of them, like some of them are on lifetime parole, parole like literally. But they're also living in housing, as Sarah was talking about, housing where the housing is completely shaped by systems of carcerality, where there, you know, there's curfews and this and that, and just the saturation of that language. And I hear myself go to as a go to when sometimes when I'm exhausted or when I'm frightened or when I'm worried and I want to feel like I have control, especially in parenting that I'm like grabbing for control. And I find myself using very carceral language and almost like a mouthpiece that that sometimes doesn't even speak to my intention. So I like this, you know, it's like the idea of, you know, the kind of healing, the kind of way that we take on language of the state. Um, and so I'm trying to slow down and listen before I speak. I'm actually trying to listen before I speak because I feel like there's some undoing. And I um, was teaching a class. This is related, even though it might sound like I'm going totally off on, on um, se sexualities for an undergraduate course. And we, uh, we're, re we're listening to a podcast by Kim Talbear where she was talking about se or sexuality. And it was a kind of radical rethinking of, the relationship between like our own erotic life or intimacy, uh, the, you know, the kind of letting go of the fiction of control over other bodies or over other people, <laughs> over like the way the contractual agreements that we make around <laughs> intimacy and relationality. And so that's been kind of mind blowing. And it's been great to do that journey with some of my students because for them listening to it was, it really shifted for them so much of how they've been thinking. Um, I, I said um, offline that like abolition happens on the most intimate level. I feel, I feel like that's where it's starting for me right now. It is, I have a 16 year old son and I have, a, and we have a really, sometimes we have a conflictual, really intense relationship. <laughs> And I, I'm, I, I'm having to rethink parenting uh, and, and relinqu relinquishing control over like what I think this person is supposed to be in relationship to, like, I'm just trying to figure out like, this is not the kind of intimacy that I, I don't want it to be a, a carceral intimacy with my son, <laughs> you know, like either you do this or like, and so I'm really work and it's a, it's a struggle. It really like freedom is a constant. This is a struggle to get to a place of freedom in our relationship. But I feel like that because we, he and I've spent so much time in the house together and he's not around his friends. It's been really the, the big lesson for me over the past year is like, how, how are we, how are we going to be together and be free to be each other together? Um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Um, yeah, I think similarly, I, I'm a parent of a toddler. And so I think about this a little bit through that lens as well. And he is just sort of learning the sound of words. And so he's like choosing words that he likes the sound of. So things like Poland, um, for some reason, I was 
you know, there's a place called Poland. And he really loved the sound of that word. Uh, but um, the other one that we were talking about recently that he loves is unruly. And he just like runs with it. And he just says unruly, really, 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 really. Like it's just, just something that he really loves hearing himself say. And, you know, it's been an interesting moment this past year of trying to think about what we can shake loose. Like, how can we break rules that seem so sentimented, se sedimented, but we see are not in this crisis. And so trying to think about that in everyday life at the same time that it's been traumatic, right, for everyone, although in different ways and to different degrees. But I feel one of the things I've been thinking about is um, and, that, and actually Natalie's questions about what pr privacy means and, and, and in relation to, to refusal makes me think about this even more, which is the, the category of evasion, you know, like we're all sort of trying to evade this threat. And what does that lens produce in thinking about how people of color and poor people are always trying to evade threats, right? The threat of policing, the threat of incarceration is sort of like this surreptitious way of moving a kind of, if we're trying to every day think about what we need and where we can go to not get sick, right? Hopefully, um, I know all of uh, so much work around disability rights has been really shining a light on this, right? Now you know how it feels, right? To live this way. Um, but the, it's not just illness, right? It's like all of these other ways that we're trying to evade harm. And so just kind of thinking about the tenuous of it on an everyday level, right? How are you going to eat? How are you going to maybe try and see someone safely um, has made me really rethink kind of the relationship between evasion and harm and and as an abolitionist like sort of long-standing abolitionist tradition of, of having us rethink harm um and i guess the other kind of word that comes to mind is just reproduction not necessarily biological reproduction but what it means to in this you know social reproduction what we make and remake in the home um how does that site relate to what is made and remade in sites of detention and jail and prison as abolitionist practices and resources? And so um, what would it mean to think about like intimate spheres or semi-private spheres or domestic, uh, all sorts of like places where in, on the everyday level, reproduction is happening in an abolitionist way, the reproduction of ideas or materials um, I'm really just always think about what Mariam Kaba says about abolition, abolition happening all the time, right? Most people do not respond to harm by calling the police. There are other, at least anti-police, if not abolitionist practices happening and how can we kind of remake them? So those are kind of some of the things that come to mind. Gracias for sharing those. It makes me think back to, uh, you know, Ruthie, of course, his name has been spinning around. She says uh, at one time she said freedom is a place. Um, and I think about that, the labor of making that happen. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, Nicole, you were talking about listening and, and, and Ruthie and Dion's conversation. They talked about radical listening um, and radical dependency. What does that mean? Uh, and I'm thinking about those spaces of art that um, the people you've worked with have created inside of, of radical dependency where where autonomy is essential and autonomy only happens in relationship to the whole. So what can that mean of collectivity or collective imagination or, for example, abolition? How do, how do we stand side by side thinking about self-determination um, and migration, for example, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, land, uh, property, things like that. Um, I wanted and to, I, uh, oh, go, please, please. I'm sorry. I, I think part of what I was saying earlier when I was talking about loyalty is connected to what you just said about radical dependency. And mm -hmm. I have to say that when, the, when we first started to learn about the pandemic last spring, that the people in my life who were quickest to respond were formerly incarcerated people who with such urgency started to work to get folks they know out of prison. Like they 
I mean, I have like Mary Baxter, who's in the book. I mean, she was showing up at the jail in Philadelphia every single day with bail money that she had gotten from community bail funds, bailing folks out of uh, out of prison. And it was that type of radical. It was she knows what's at stake if people are allowed to stay in those death boxes during a pandemic. Um, James Huff was doing the same thing. And with such fearlessness and um, and not and, and without the luxury of ignorance of act, like of, yeah. of not knowing what the conditions inside, like knowing, you know, in very intimate ways what it means to have an illness in a crowded space, a space where you're both overcrowded in your warehouse and you're anonymous, you're all these things, but you're not cared for. Yeah, so I thought we would end um, with a poem by Asata Shakur, who um, was part of the constellation of books chosen for this year's Literature for Justice, and um, who, of course, is it's always a loss and an absence not to be able to be in direct conversation with her and her, and her work. Um, and another reason for reading this is, you know, um, Nicole had talked a, about Kim Talbert and rethinking our relationships and relationality um, and thinking about pleasure and how important that, important that is and how, um, how policed and surveilled pleasure is uh, in our lives generally, but of course in the carceral system, so much that we don't even often use the word. And I'm thinking, of course, uh, how, um, you know, like things like masturbation are illegal and punished, you know, it's a punitive um, act. And, and then I'm also thinking about um, Sarah uh, talking about um, reiteration and reproduction and the danger of that and how this, this is a time in which we might come out on one of many other sides and not reproduce some of what um, we have done in the past, whether as daily practice or uh, language. So, um, I'll end with this, uh, a poem by Asata Shakur, and the title is Affirmation. I believe in living. I believe in the spectrum of beta days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine, in windmills and waterfalls, tricycles and rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts and sprouts grow into trees. I believe in the magic of the hands and in the wisdom of the eyes, I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life, and I have seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth, sculpting mud bodies in its path. I have seen the destruction of the daylight and seen bloodthirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut glass. I have eaten crow and blunder bread and breathed the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters, gagged by the greedy. And if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living, I believe in birth, I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that a lost ship steered by tired seasick sailors can still be guided home to port. And I wanna thank both of you, um, Sarah and Nicole, just again for, for the work that you're doing, of course, for the time you're here with us today, um, but I know that work, uh, it's emotional work, you know, we know that it's ours, we know that it's, uh, it's physical things like exhaustion, but it's also, I think, uh, you know, emotional exhaustion and, um, and the ways that you are, are bringing us to a different emotional scape of these questions and these inquiries. So finding joy, you know, there's so much tenderness in, in both of your books and um, they've been real gifts, I know, to me personally. Uh, in relationship to my own family, and also um, the ways that I've watched them resound out into different communities. So, uh, mil gracias for being here with us. Um, 
I also want to uh, remind our audience that there, there are links to both of the books. Um, and so you'll be able to find those and, and purchase those. But um, yeah, Sarah, Nicole, gracias.